People always ask how I balance my family life with 400 shows a year. I'm just doing what I love with the people I love. It's my magic life. I like Wes Isley. I like everything about him. All right, so uh, we are 40 episodes into season two, and I think Natalie and I may have um, overbooked ourselves. <laughs> Today we have a, um, I'm calling him a brain doctor, but I'll let him explain. It's the, um, his name is Toby Passman. Uh, his website is roscoeswetsuitneuro.com. But um, everybody, let's welcome Toby. What's up, buddy? How are you? Hey, uh, Wes, I'm good. I'm good. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. You're so you're not a brain doctor. Explain to the uh, everybody listening your job title. Yes, not technically a brain doctor. Those that uh, those in academia with PhDs would uh, would get a little bit irritated with that title so <laughs> instead uh yeah i'm a i'm a neurophysiology researcher i'm board certified in um in neuro a couple different forms of, of neuromodulation which we'll get into talking about but uh, i basically uh am board certified in brain mapping uh it's called qeeg brain mapping basically measuring the electrical activity of people's brains and kind of correlating how the different uh, dysregulations in the different electrical frequencies are correlated with people's symptoms, uh, behavior, thoughts, uh, just all sorts of different uh, things about the way people experience the world. Um, and then the other uh, board certification I has, have is in neurofeedback, which is one of the primary technologies that we use to actually uh, rewire the brain and uh, kind of reconfigure that electrical activity once we know uh, what and where in the brain is dysregulated. So I got to start out. How'd you get in this field? What, what brought you to that field? Great, Great question. Yeah. So uh, in college, I was taking some different classes, trying to figure out what I was interested in. And it was really this biopsychology class that really, really fascinated me. So learning kind of the, the, biological basis of how the brain functions on both a chemical and electrical level. Um, the class was really fascinating to me, and I, at that point, learned that there were several labs at my university, several research labs, that, that actually measured the electrical activity of people's brains uh, as part of the research studies. So it's a bit harder to measure what's going on chemically in the in the brain because you'd have to do a very invasive procedure called a spinal tap and it's kind of hard to hard to convince people uh recruit subjects to do that that kind of invasive work so instead the majority of us in this uh, line of research are, are measuring the electrical side of things so i started working at the at the research lab and um was really also very interested by everything I was learning there as far as kind of how to how to collect and analyze the the brain data. But uh, but I was really I really as I was graduating college, I was really pondering the question of, you know, now that now that I was working at this had been working at this lab and and we're measuring what people's brains were doing naturally, I started having the question, you know, is there a way that we can actually modify and improve the electrical activity that you know we're just measuring we're not doing anything we're not giving any inputs to the brain and so i became really really obsessed with you know answering that question and and the answer to that question is basically this whole field of of neuromodulation um, and neurofeedback and brain mapping and all of this stuff that i've got into it's a whole field kind of dedicated to actively working with with patients and clients, uh, both in uh, in clinical settings, along with more peak performance uh, oriented stuff, um, for people who are looking to actually um, kind of use use the brain's inherent neuroplasticity, its ability to change itself, and actually improve the biological basis of their brain, which then in turn improves a lot of different aspects of people's lives. Wow, so. I know enough to get me in trouble with this conversation. Somehow, some way, 
I listened to a podcast, and it was somebody that you credited on your website, uh, Dave Asprey. So yes. did he come up with the idea of all the biofeedback um, different studies that you're, like, emulating? Are you doing, like, his no. branch of that? No. Okay. You know, that's a great – so so Dave is definitely a huge – he's been a huge inspiration to me, actually, when I was kind of – had just – gotten into this whole uh realm of like peak performance and i mean even actually back in high school i started reading his blog and started listening i was like the first podcast his podcast was like the first podcast i really um you know started listening to so he was he was just a big inspiration for me um and was awesome to end up getting him as a guest on my show eventually um but yeah he's he's not specifically in uh, uh, he's not exactly a pioneer in terms of uh, uh, all of the, the neurotechnology stuff. Um, credit him for the making the you know the bulletproof coffee and all the great supplements that he does. But you now, as far as as far as the, the the this technology was really it's it's kind of you know in the same way that you know we now we now have an iPhone, but it you know originally started you know the first cell phone with some you know clunky flip phone uh flip phone or you know whatever it was um you know it's it's in the same way that technology progresses uh the, the neurotechnology that i work with now is is kind of its origins were uh kind of back since since the 1930s when the first eeg which the listeners um an electroencephalogram um, basically, the the test that I use to measure the electrical activity of the brain uh, that was first done uh, by a German neuroscientist back in the 1930s, and ever since then they've been kind of honing the technology. We saw how um, they started kind of uh, they started modulating brain activity using electroconvulsive therapy in in the 50s and 60s, and uh, obviously, that that led to its fair amount of, of side effects and problems, and you know, then we then we had, um, you know, some of the uh, some of the transcranial magnetic stimulation, which still is a, a pretty effective treatment um, used a lot of places for depression, um, but now it's kind of gotten refined further and further to the point um, where we're able to to very precisely um, alter. Um, the electrical activity of the brain, but but yeah, this this people have been working working to to improve and enhance this technology um, for for almost a century now. All right, so Dave Asprey, Bulletproof Coffee. Yes, I remember him now. But I I heard a podcast with a guy that was doing things similar to you. I guess it wasn't Dave Asprey. Um, before uh, I get before I get to this question though, I have a degree in marketing. What is the deal with Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro dot com? Your name is Toby uh, Passman. What? Where, who is Roscoe? Right. What does wetsuits have to do with it? What, what's going on here? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So I guess that was that was part of the idea. Was I like the I like that it was sort of an icebreaker question. Okay. Um, got you got it. Curious. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's basically an inside reference to a, one of my favorite musical artists, Childish Gambino. He released a screenplay that went along with one of his albums, and there's a uh, this reoccurring character of, of or reoccurring words of Roscoe's wetsuit that is written in graffiti different places um, as you kind of move uh, through the screenplay, and the main character is trying to figure out you know what in the world Roscoe's wetsuit is. Um, at the end of the screenplay, he comes across a kid who's scribbling it on a napkin at a cafe, and he confronts the kid and, you know, demands, you know, an answer. What is Roscoe's wetsuit? And the kid's response was, I don't know. I just saw it online. Gotcha. So <laughs> Roscoe's wetsuit uh, essentially doesn't actually mean anything. Um, but metaphorically, I think it means a lot in terms of just speaking on the the way in which a lot of people nowadays in, in today's society, it's, you know, we're all following trends and following what's cool online and, uh, you know, I originally named my podcast the Roscoe's Wetsuit um, Podcast, and and the idea behind that was trying to create a platform where I was, you know, uh, delivering very, very unique content um, and just trying to create something, uh, create something of my own. So 
the, the name kind of started there and, and just kind of branched off of that as I, as I opened my company. So getting back to my question, the, the, the podcast that I heard was about a guy doing neurofeedback like you're doing. And he was, I, I don't, I don't have that page pulled up, but, uh, let's see here. Boom. He was doing the, the brain mapping and all of this and hooking up your, the, the probes to your brain and your, they could follow your eye scan across the different, the, like the, whatever. And it would correct. And then they could tell you later on, but that was for like brain injuries and things, right? Um, uh-huh concussions, things like that. It, it, who are your who are your customers that you're working with? Are you working with people with brain injuries? Are you working with concussion people? Are you working... I don't know. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I'm all over the place, man. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's a very great, good question. So, you know, first off, I'll just preface by saying, you know, while, while doing this work and, and looking at, you know, countless you know, thousands of brain maps at this point, um, there is evidence that probably, I would say around 90% of people have, have evidence of a head injury in their past. I do. So whether, yeah, whether, whether we're directly, you know, say focusing on, on a head injury or we're just, you know, working to regulate the way someone's brain is working, you know, I think we're always sort of, you know, working on a, on a brain injury in a way. Um, but in terms of, in terms of people who, who are directly wanting to, to see me, um, for a head injury. So I, I will, I, I the practice that I currently at, I, I, that I'm currently at, I work under uh, a clinical psychologist and, you know, we do use this technology to treat traumatic brain injuries along with other mental health conditions and neurodegenerative conditions such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. Now, with my company, with Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro, it's specifically peak performance oriented. So I'm not actually um, going out and, and saying, you know, we're going to, you know, treat someone's depression or doing this. Uh, you know, it's, it's more so, you know, getting people to um, kind of the, the, cognitive changes that they would like to happen um without without it being kind of a a diagnosis based process um so i guess to to answer your question yes the technology absolutely has great applications for head injuries but no i do not um specifically in my company work with people who've had recent tbis so like PTSD that wouldn't work either. Con- uh, concussions, drug abuse would. would no, you... I mean absolutely. I, I worked at a rehabilitation center in South Florida for a for a couple years dealing with with a lot of that stuff. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of the, a lot of times the mental health along with the substance abuse go you know hand in hand. They're comorbidity uh, comorbidity issues there. Um, so yeah, I saw and worked successfully with a lot of, uh, PTSD cases, a lot of substance abuse. Um, but again, that's not something, uh, it's sort of, it's sort of just the way in which my company is marketed. You could think of it as, um, you know, in the same way there's, there's, you, you know, your physical therapists, you know, who are working directly on an injury. Um, but then there's also your personal trainers, you know, who, who are sort of taking someone who's probably otherwise, you know, somewhat healthy and, and kind of optimizing them to get them to whatever peak performance that they're looking for. So okay. it's, it's okay. just kind of in the way in which, you know, I go about looking for my clientele and, and what kind of the, the, you know, niche that I'm trying to fill is just a bit different. But no, absolutely, for this, this technology that I work with, for every single condition that you've mentioned so far, there's there's great um, efficacy in, in the applications. Well, that's what I heard the other doctor promoting and touting. That that's what he was working on. You know the the drug abuse and the you know the impulsivity factor of a brain injury. The guy was uh, yeah one of his customers. Just you know he had he couldn't control his impulsivity, so in, impulsiveness. And through the brain scanning thing, I mean, they were able to see that he had a 70% improvement, but um, they were able, he said he would have been able to do better, but he didn't have that patient as long as he'd like to. It was a 
it was a quick, you know, he only had him for three months instead of, you know, what he wanted and insurance didn't pay for it and all that stuff. So explain to me. All right. So I was going to tell you, I had a brain injury. Um, I was a little kid. I was probably 10 years old, 12 years old tops. And um, I was riding in the back of my dad's truck and we were in a store parking lot. And he was driving really slow. And I'm like, I can jump out of a moving vehicle at this pace. Um, and, you know, trying to be a boy and trying to be cool. But I went in the wrong direction. And I didn't understand momentum at that point. And when my feet hit, my head, you know, went towards the car. So I jumped away from the vehicle, uh, trying to run in the opposite direction. And I just got body slammed to the concrete. And uh, I laid there and, you know, everybody gathered around. And I got up and jumped and ran to the curb. I was embarrassed, but I was hurt. And I know I had a concussion that day. You know, I told my dad I was okay because I was embarrassed. But um, would that be something that you would take care of or no? Because I'm already injured. <laughs> you just want you right. want peak performance. What, what's going on there? Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I was trying to get at um, in starting the, the conversation about the head injuries is, you know, the fact that it's like since so many people have had them, you know, at some point in the past, it's like I always feel like, you know, even, even with the peak performance orientation, you know, part of that might still be addressing some of the, the dysfunction, the dysregulation and electrical activity that, you know, if we can't say for certain, if I did a brain map on you today, Wes, you know, I can't say for certain that, uh, you know, that, that if we saw dysregulation, you know, uh, that it is, you know, necessarily because of that, that head injury, that, that, um, that concussion that you sustained then, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a possibility and there's specific, there, there are a couple specific markers such as if you're producing a lot of what's called waking Delta, Delta being the slowest of the brain waves, it's usually seen a lot in really deep sleep, but for people uh, who've had a head injury that have a really impacted area of their brain, uh, we usually see uh, a a lot of uh, a lot of delta activity being produced while they're wide awake so if i saw that you know that would be a good uh, indicator to me you know that that area of the brain might might still be damaged um it's sort of an indicator that that area is offline it's not properly able to take in the blood flow and oxygenation that brain cells need and brain networks need in order to function optimally so that would absolutely be something that, you know, we would work on, on correcting. Um, other times, you know, it's, it's not so cut and dry where, uh, the brain does have a lot of, you know, its own self repair mechanisms built into place. So sometimes, uh, people have sustained, you know, a head injury or even multiple head injuries in the past that might, and they might still have a fairly normal looking brain map. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, people have varying degrees of, you know, just how well uh, their brain is able to actually, uh, you know, cope with and heal itself from from a past head injury. Yeah, well, I know I have some dark spots because I played football as well. So there's got to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it can't be yeah, good. It can't be good. Took a toll. Yeah. Right, right. So where do you think all of this is going to be in 20 years with Elon Musk and the Neuralink and all of that? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, that's what I think about a lot in, in terms of, you know, where I think that this technology is going to get in 20 years. I mean, I think we're going to just start seeing, we're, we're already seeing a lot of consumer, you know, neuroscience devices, um, being sold to people nowadays, a lot of different companies popping up, but I think we're really going to see this, this technology that I work with, um, really start working its way into both mainstream medicine you know i I think uh you know a lot of say like primary care doctors you know they they do all these different tests blood work and stuff you know yearly physical you know if they were to add in a brain map um you know and measure the electrical activity of your brain year in year out you could potentially you know if you go back to your doctor and say hey um you know i'm experiencing depression and brain fog and all of these things that, you know, I hadn't been experiencing when I saw you last year, you know, then they could compare, you know, see what your scan looked like last year and see what it's looking like now. Um, that's just one application, but I mean, you know, I think, I think eventually, you know, maybe in 20 years, maybe it'll take longer than that, but I think, 
I think I think twenty years is a reasonable time frame to think that these technologies are start going to start getting into a lot of people's homes, uh, a lot of schools. There's already uh, a lot of schools that have started to implement uh, neurofeedback training because you know if you can if you can take a kid who who has the highest degree of neuroplasticity as as children are. You know, our brains are so malleable, they're so resilient and capable of, of rewiring themselves. It is a great idea to start, you know, this sort of neuro training uh, really early on and, and teaching kids just the ability to self-regulate their, their nervous system, I think, is just a huge, huge skill that I, I think could, could greatly, you know, reduce the amounts of behavioral outbursts and stuff that, that kids have and you know, improve their focus. We've got a whole generation or generations now of kids who've, who've been prescribed Adderall and Ritalin for their attention deficit uh, and hyperactivity disorder, you know, since often, you know, when, when they're very young, uh, they start taking that. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's huge applications that we're going to start seeing in schools and then, you know, people, uh, people at home, you know, in the, in the same way you might, uh, you know, own, own, you know, some, some workout equipment. I think we're going to start seeing people, um, just, you know, it, it become nor- more normalized for people to own different, you know, pieces of neurotechnology that they can actually use with, uh, you know, for themselves and their family to, to really, you know, focus on getting the most of their brain and really, uh, really making sure that that organ stays healthy um, you know, especially, especially as you age, um, you know, we all understand the, the importance, I feel like at this point of, you know, of, of, uh, you know, exercising for your, your physical health. Um, and I really, I really do think that kind of brain health is, is really going to be the next frontier of that. So I think it's super exciting to see what, you know, is going to happen with, with my field just within the next 20 years. And, and obviously everything with like what you mentioned with Elon Musk and, and his idea of trying to implant the, the chip into people's brains or um, being able to download your, uh, your, your brain into a chip, whatever it is. Um, it's, it's definitely a, a wild, crazy idea. And if it was, if it was someone besides Elon Musk exactly. who was saying it, I might be, I might be pretty darn skeptical, but Elon Musk has, has done an, so many incredible things uh that have defied what we thought was was possible that you know i'm i kind of kind of rooting for him that (laughs) we'll be able to figure it out but i think i think that's probably you know something more more likely to more likely in the way that he's talked about it i think that's more likely maybe that's you know 50 years 100 years i don't i don't think you know i don't think in 20 years we're we're all going to be downloading our brains into computer chips. I don't think the technology is, is at that level quite yet. Wouldn't you like a scan of his brain? Yeah, that would be, you know, I, I've thought about that just, you know, seeing like really, really intelligent and unique people's brains, you know, looking at like, you know, athletes and, and you know, uh, actors and just, just people – you know, whoever are at the kind of top of their game or have just done really incredible things in this world, I'm I'm always so curious to see, um, yeah, to see what what their brain maps would look like, and um, yeah, there's there's definitely certain certain things that we know about peak performers' brains that, that differentiates them from um, you know a standard brain, but um, each brain is very unique. So yeah, absolutely, I would. I would pay good money to see Elon Musk's brain. So, <laughs> go ahead. I, I have a question, and it might be a dumb one. So, <laughs> hold I'm on, sorry. hold on. We're on a podcast. She just raised her hand. I, All right, yeah, but go ahead, honey. I do. <laughs> um, it might be a dumb question, so I'm sorry. But peak performers, like you were talking about, if if you were comparing brain maps of someone who's more artistic, like an actor, and someone who's more uh, sporty, you know, like a football player, peak performance. Are they similar or are they completely different because it's two completely different um, things that they're doing, even though they're both the peak performers? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and, and I would say even within each of those groups, it, it varies significantly. 
Um, oh, okay. What I will say about the – yeah, what I will – no, and it's a really, really good question, um, one that I there's just not enough published data that I could say one way or another – um, that these people's brains consistently look like X and these people's brains consistently look like Y. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of variability um, just, just between, you know, whatever, whatever sort of group that you're looking at. But, uh, but definitely the creative types tend to have a lot more um, of, of kind of these slower brain waves called alpha and theta brain waves. Mm-hmm. Alpha is um, sometimes they, they sort of call um, – you know, sort of the, the key to creativity um, when you're able to sink into that state where your, your brain kind of slows down a bit. It's sort of an idling rhythm of the brain where um, you can start really just exploring your mind and, and kind of creatives have this, uh, you know, uncanny ability to really uh, produce uh, great quantities and really uh, high amplitudes of their alpha brain waves and, and same with theta brain waves, which are even slower and often produced in deep meditative states or um, kind of states of visualization. Uh, they're linked to sort of aha moments where things just kind of click together in your mind. So there's, those are, those are a couple of the, the main brain waves that, you know, I definitely think about when it comes to, to looking at those creative types. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I'm so, glad it was a good question and not a dumb question, though. <laughs> not, not at all, no. <laughs> I don't know. Mine might be bad. I have one here. So, Elon says that he's a highly functioning autistic person. He says he's autistic. The first host of Saturday Night Live that had autism. Yes. That proclaimed it. Yes. Can you see that on a brain scan? Is that a, I don't know if that's a bad thing to ask or not, but can you see what causes yeah. it? Yeah. Or what makes him highly functional compared to another person that is on a different level of the scale, the spectrum? Yeah. No, I mean, that's that's a great, great question. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that, that, that certainly being, the, uh, being that it is a spectrum, you know, it can manifest itself pretty differently um, with different kind of brain maps that you take a look at. Um, oftentimes... Uh, some of the the areas of the brain that are most affected uh, that I'm aware of are usually the temporal lobes, which sort of sit right above your ear, right right above and behind your ears, um, kind of on the sides of the head. And that those those areas of the brain are really important for a lot of kind of social behavior, facial recognition, a lot of a lot of these things that we often see as being dysregulated. Um, with autism, um, there's there's another one, um, basically um, called the uh, a mu rhythm, which is kind of a a specific uh, brainwave pattern or a, a, a form that usually we don't see in most people's brains, but uh, autistic individuals usually um, do have that uh, mu rhythm going on, um, which is basically uh, a sort of their, their mirror neuron system, uh, basically their, their ability to kind of uh, perceive what's going on um, with, with other people, um, what other people are doing, um, that, that sort of indicates that that system is not functioning properly and there's sort of a, a frontal lobe um, disengagement. So there, there's, there's a lot of different things that could be going on in autism and obviously someone like uh, Elon Musk, who is very, very, very high functioning um, with Asperger's, you know, it, it certainly, um, certainly could be those same areas of the brain um, that that are affected. But um, yeah, it would be super interesting to to look at that. And there's there's lots of people within um, kind of within my domain of of brain mapping who you know do have practices where they're directly experts in autism. So those individuals, I'm sure, would have a lot more to say specifically. But um, but yes, I mean, to answer your question overall, um, absolutely. We, we uh, you know, the, the brain maps of autistic individuals um, almost always show very significant dysregulations. And um, we're oftentimes able to see a lot of really good effects uh, with the different treatments. 
Wow. So you're able to maybe zero them in to a normal normal type thing instead of being more sporadic. Yeah, I mean, there. It, as far as the, you know, whether we could, uh, you know, ever completely right. uh, normalize, right, you know, right. is, is, I guess, up for, for debate. I mean, I've heard anecdotally, um, you know, certain children who've, who've done uh, neurofeedback, you know, being one of the main technologies that helps regulate the brain. Um, and I just mentioned, mentioned that a little bit. It's basically where you're, you're sort of hooked up to, to the EEG cap. We're measuring the electrical activity of your brain. And then people are watching, you know, a screen, uh, either a screen or they're listening to tones coming in through, uh, uh, headphones. And they're basically, uh, they're basically as the, as the uh, screen gets larger or as the tones get louder, as basically the positive reinforcement that's telling the person's brain, um, you know, good job, you know, you keep doing whatever it is that you're doing. And then as someone, uh, as someone saw the screen got smaller or the tones got quieter, that's the, the signal back, the feedback saying, you know, no, go back to what you were doing to make the screen larger or the tones louder. Um, so it's basically a direct way that we can tell the brain when it's working, when it's working optimally and when it needs to change its function. So, so that specific technology, um, there's been a lot of, of uh, a lot of, autistic individuals who have used that as therapy um, a lot of practitioners that have achieved really really great success and just reading anecdotal stories there's there's definitely been people who who claim to have been on the spectrum and then they did enough neurofeedback and you know now they don't they don't classify you know their symptoms uh, they feel like are so kept at bay that they don't they don't feel like they're you know on on the spectrum anymore wow that's awesome so could I don't know because you're you're reading the brain, but could you do it with eye movement? To I'm seeing it as like an app for your home phone. You said there were um, things that you can buy, you know, for home use. Because a Snapchat right. Snapchat can reverse the camera, and you can put a silly mustache on yourself. Why couldn't it? <laughs> why couldn't you play a game and have the eye movement regulate you where the thing is on the game and to help keep concentration and to keep you from looking all over the place. You know, I told Natalie when I read comic books earlier, um, I, I'll read a thing and then I'll look around the whole page, then I'll read some more, then I'll look around the whole page. I guess you're supposed to look a little bit, but I can't focus enough to read one square at a time. I'm all over the place. That neurofeedback would help me. Uh, right, right. I mean, that's, it's definitely, I think, moving in the direction of, uh, you know, there, there are some apps uh what I'm thinking of, gosh, um, there's there's Muse, which is like a headband, um, along with an app. So it's like you basically you you wear this headband on your forehead, um, and it has a few electrode sensors built in it, and you're you're basically uh, I think it's it's teaching you teaching people to meditate. So it delivers direct feedback. It's measuring the electrical activity of those of your forehead um, or the the brain the prefrontal cortex sitting right behind the forehead um, and then teaching teaching people's brains how to get into a, a quiet, calm, relaxed state. So so there, there definitely are those consumer devices, you know, out there right now um, that can do a bit of this. But I guess I would say, you know, it's it's tricky in terms of when, you know, when you when you have an issue, a serious issue, you know, with your car, you know, maybe, you know, you're, you, you need to replace your oil, whatever, you know, you could do that yourself or something. Um, but, you know, when you really have a, a serious issue with your car, you're probably going to want to bring it to a mechanic who knows exactly what they're doing. They've had the training. And that's sort of my perspective, obviously a biased perspective coming from someone who, who has the training and the certifications in this field. But, um, you know, there, there's so much information that we collect when we initially do someone's brain map, and that basically provides this whole roadmap, um, you know, for their whole training. So we're able to know, you know, exactly which frequencies need to be altered. Do they need to be upregulated? Do they need to be downregulated? And in which areas of the brain that needs to occur in. So when you get to playing around with some of these, you know, 
different consumer devices, uh, you know, you, you, the best case scenario, you know, you might find something that works well for you, but you know, worst case is if say, just to give you, give you an example here, you know, uh, oftentimes beta brain waves, uh, we see a lot of, of high beta brain waves associated with, um, with anxiety, kind of negative ruminations, uh, trouble falling asleep, insomnia, uh, a lot of, a lot of kind of conditions of over arousal show up that way. But on the flip side, a lot of, a lot of times ADHD shows up as a deficiency of beta brain waves. So for those individuals with ADHD, with ADHD, they're going to do great on a beta, on a protocol that's designed to, to increase beta brain waves. Now that group of, of, the anxious insomniacs who already have plenty of, of beta brain waves, they could actually potentially worsen their symptoms by giving themselves more of something that they already are producing in excess. So that's why personally I'm so, I, I almost never, you know, in my company, I, I never begin working with, with anyone, with any clients before actually getting that initial brain map done, because I think it's that important that we don't um, that we don't push the brain in a way that um, that it doesn't want to go um, and really just zone in on exactly what the brain needs uh, before before actually you know we start tweaking with something that's you know so vitally important you know our the, the way our our brain functions and you know our cognition our ability to focus and have a good mood all these things are so important we don't want to we don't want to push things in the wrong direction, you know, which, which could happen without doing this full kind of comprehensive brain map analysis. Yeah. So this could, that, um, what is it called? Biofeedback that can help with ADHD as well? Or do yeah. they have to be off, yeah. off the Ritalin in order for it to help because the Ritalin, um, you know, suppresses it? Does that Great make- question. Yeah. Uh, they have found both in, in people who are uh, non-medicated along with people who are, are still taking medication, um, both groups still benefit. Okay. Um, and a lot of times people, yeah, a lot of times people are able to reduce their, their dosage of medication, you know, even if they're not able to get off of it entirely, although, uh, you know, there definitely is a fair amount of people uh, with ADHD who, who do neurofeedback training, who, who I've heard, you know, are able to get off their medication. So, um, yeah, I would say it's, it's, it's actually kind of with, with biofeedback and neurofeedback, a lot of its earliest applications actually kind of date back to sort of the 1970s where, uh, um, they, they sort of began 1970s, but really, really the nineties, um, where they started really having good success treating treating children with ADHD. Okay, cool. That's awesome. So they've proven that, you know, I, I, when I was little, they said that we only use 10% of our brain. Do, you, do we know everything about the brain yet? Or is it still one of those things we won't know everything oh, about no. the brain for 100 years? I mean, is there spots of the brain like you, I have no idea. No one's ever been there. We have no idea what that does. Huh. Well, we, we, the thing is, we know what all of these different areas of the brain, we, we, we have an understanding of, you know, the function of a lot of these different localized areas. But in terms of how all of the different areas communicate with each other, how consciousness, you know, is actually generated, still being, you know, the, the huge mystery of, of neuroscience and mystery of the universe. Um, you know, there, there, no, there, there's so much to go. Um, and that's, that's actually, I think was part of, you know, why I got so drawn into the field was I thought it was so exciting that we could, you know, bring, you know, say, say with some of the technology I use, there's new research studies that come out, you know, that I, I might read a a paper in a journal and, and they showed that, placing the electrodes at these locations and stimulating this frequency, you know, uh, greatly improves someone's OCD symptoms. So, and now I have a, a new protocol that I might be able to try out. So, 
it's no neuroscience is, is definitely a constantly adapting and ever evolving uh, science. And as far as when we'll know everything about the brain, I I don't know if I don't know if that'll ever be the case. I think uh, it'll just continue to be refined. Our understanding will continue to be refined further and further. But I wouldn't doubt if you know in twenty years and fifty years we look back to where we're at now um, in neuroscience and and think you know gosh how did we miss this or you know we really thought this meant that but it it doesn't you know there's there's probably going to be some some more huge discoveries in the you know coming decades so yeah it's it's absolutely absolutely something that uh you know probably 100 years from now we we still will just be you know chipping away at the the iceberg that is you know our understanding of the brain well i'm sitting here on your website looking at a picture of the brain I have a, I have maybe a dumb question. Just glance over it because it's got nothing to do with you, but when am I going to have a brain doctor on here? I know you're not a doctor, but in my mind you are. <laughs> uh, a lobotomy. What the heck were they thinking with that? Uh, what was that about? Yeah, so so the frontal lobes, uh, you know, are, are in charge of a lot of the, you know, executive functioning, thinking about things, um, planning, but when they are sort of dysregulated, uh, that's where a lot of kind of aggressive, irritable uh, behavior, a lot of kind of criminality has been associated with dysregulation in the frontal lobes. So their uh, their solution to that was let's just uh, cut them out and see what happens. So, so that was uh, the impulsiveness. Lobotomies. If you got rid yeah, of that, you exactly. got rid of impulsiveness. Exactly. So, okay. you know... Yeah, it was, it was used, I believe, you know, it was like schizophrenia. I think they would do it sometimes for bipolar disorder. Oh, um, okay. Also, and, and this, I think, was the most legitimate use and actually still is. Um, they, they do uh, not like full frontal lobotomies, uh, not by, I believe anymore, but where they do remove pieces of the brain um, for epilepsy. You know where where they've where people have just tried all the different anti seizure medications and are still suffering from uh, from epilepsy. They can actually go in and and take out that portion of the brain um, that's that's kind of causing that might be kind of the, the center of, of where all the epilepsy is. And they found really good success still doing that. So, um, but yeah, for for what they used to do. Uh, kind of in the mid 1900s, it was you know very very crude. I mean, it the idea sort of makes sense, but you know when you, when you take away uh, the frontal lobes, you not only are you taking away you know the the impulsiveness and and anger problems and everything else, you're also taking away you know the the vast majority of someone's personality. Um, you know what really makes them them. They become a zombie. So, so they become a zombie. Exactly. With the epilepsy stuff, um, where they take out just portions, mm -hmm. has does that mess up a little bit of personality or anything like that, or is that sort of sort of yeah. like sectioned off from the epilepsy part? Yeah. Epilepsy part. It's it's a that's a great great question and and one I would love to have that conversation exactly with like a neurosurgeon uh, who gotcha. would know a lot more than I do. Okay. Um, but my understanding is, you know, that the, the, uh, you know, certain parts of the brain, um, you know, might, might not be incredibly crucial for, you know, uh, personality or for someone's sense of, you know, self, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of areas that might be removed, you know, in the case of epilepsy and, um, someone's still going to feel like the same, you know, person that they were prior to the surgery, after the surgery. Okay. Um, the other thing I would, I would say is that we, the brain is, is so capable of uh, basically taking over functions. Uh, so certain parts of the brain, um, say, say in the case of, uh, you know, when there's, uh, you know, been um, – uh, like visual loss, um, you know, someone, someone is, is no longer seeing, uh, you know, if they're blind, you know, it's like all, all of those areas involved in vision, uh, you know, the, the areas of the brain involved in vision now that they don't, you know, they're not being, they don't have to attend to helping someone see, 
uh, you know, those, those areas start working and, you know, in all these other different ways, which is, you know, really, really fascinating, but they'll basically start taking on other functions. So if you ever hear about, you know, how people say that, you know, don't have, um, they don't have, uh, you know, uh, vision or whatever they're, they're, uh, they're blind or individuals who are deaf. Oftentimes their, their other senses become very, very keen. And that's sort of an example of, of parts of the person's brain kind of taking over, um, other functions. So that, that same thing can happen with, with someone with, uh, someone who would have a, a part of their brain removed in epilepsy. It's possible that a, that a nearby area might start taking over the function of whatever the area that was removed was doing. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Indeed. I, yeah. I think it's, it's one of the, one of the coolest uh, uh, aspects of how the brain works is, is having that compensatory mechanism there. Yeah. Well, you're also, you're starting a health coaching, uh, neuro health coaching thing, or is that something you've been doing for a while? Yeah. Um, that, that is kind of the newest addition to, I guess, my skill set. Um, yeah, I just, I am just now kind of finishing a, a certification program. Um, it's from the, the Human Potential Institute. Uh, they, they basically kind of teach um, health coaching, uh, you know, more traditional life coaching, your, you know, mindsets, the psychology, um, you know, uh, actions, accountability, all this, this sort of stuff. Um, so basically the, the, the reason I, I kind of pursued that, that health coaching, uh, or the coaching realm in general is I feel like when we, you know, address the biological basis of people's problems, which is, you know, kind of the bulk of, of what my whole academic career and now professional career has consisted of, you know, when, when we, when we stabilize the electrical activity of someone's brain, it starts to become so much easier to actually address the psychological stuff. Once you cut through all of the brain fog and people are, you know, thinking, thinking super sharply and able to connect this, this dot to that dot. Um, I think, I think that really you can, you can kind of supercharge someone's results. Uh, cause you, you think about anything that they're going to want improved, um, you know, from, from a biological perspective that they're going to hope is going to improve some of their symptoms. Uh, likely that that same thing can be dealt with from a psychological perspective, you know, as well. Um, you know, so, so, I guess as, as an example, you know, say someone, uh, you know, say an aspiring lawyer, you know, they're studying for all of the bar exams, you know, and we can definitely, you know, kind of work to, to make sure all of the, the networks in the brain involved in focus and attention, make sure that in memory, you know, make sure all of that stuff is really online and functioning optimally. But also, you know, the, the, the habits that someone has in terms of, you know, their, their, their study rituals, their, you know, how they're going about, um, you know, learning, uh, learning that material, um, and just all the other different behaviors and actions that they have control over, you know, is having a huge effect too. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really trying to, you know, with Roscoe's What's Your Neuro, I'm really, I'm really wanting to bridge the, the psychological and biological interventions together um, to, which I think is really going to just supercharge people's results in life. Well, Natalie and I just started really eating clean and eating right. We had never done that before. We were like, eh, we'll try to, we'll, we'll have a salad tonight with dinner, with our cheeseburger. <laughs> but, um, I mean, everything's cleaner, brighter. We have more energy. We're sleeping better. We wake up in the morning and we're refreshed. It's funny, just diet alone has just changed that many things. So imagine, you know, if you had all these other things that you have on your website, you know, um, uh, you have all of these different things in your health coaching, your neuro health coaching, but it's also going to make us think better. It's also going to make you um, function better all the way around. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I love that, you know, you brought, brought a diet. I mean, that's, 
that's a huge component of, of brain health. I mean, maybe maybe the most important, you know. What, what we've been talking about, kind of these more advanced neurotechnologies and ways to improve the brain, I mean, you know, they're, they work great, but if someone is, you know, eating, you know, hot Cheetos all day and sleeping two hours a night and drinking, you know, a fifth of whiskey, it's, it, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be pretty hard to, to, to actually get their brain uh, to a better place. So, so really, I mean, that's also, you know, the component of, of the coaching is really just like making sure that, you know, people's people are eating, you know, anti-inflammatory diets, limiting sugar, sugar is, you know, bad for, for every organ in the body, but specifically, you know, the brain, the brain is very damaged, neurons are very damaged by excess sugar. So really working to kind of cut sugar out of people's diets as much as possible, replace it with, you know, a lot of healthy fats, your, your avocados, your coconut oil, MCT oils, um, all of those are, are really, really awesome um, for the brain. That scares so, me so bad because um, I was such into sugar uh, until like last month when I started this new health kick that my, my wife became a health coach and she's really studying and researching and she's just only on the health thing. You are the neuro guy, <laughs> but yes, she is, she is only on the health <laughs> side, but I mean, we're eating more avocados. We're eating, you know, uh, instead of noodles, we're having zucchini noodles and, and things like that. And, uh, it, it's really made a difference and we've kicked sugar. We have no sugar in our house anymore. And it's, it's weird. It's, uh, you know, that was my drug of choice. I never did anything else. I never yeah. did pot. I never did anything. But boy, as a magician being on the road, 20 hour drives, I'm, I'm eating candy and drinking, you know, diet soda to stay awake on these drives. But when you're eating right, you don't need that. It's funny. It, you thought I thought I would need the extra sugar. Yeah, the extra boost. Right. Yeah, yeah. So right. Well, that's that's the way we think about. Oftentimes, you know, we think about, you know, energy. You know, having energy, and we think of, you know, sugar being like, oh, all this, all this energy. You know, we get the sugar rush. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just such an unsustainable form of energy. Um, that obviously, you know, you get that 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 high, just like you get from, you know, cocaine. They've shown, you know, in in neuroscience studies that. They, they activate the same reward circuitry in the brain in a similar way. And, you know, it's just not, not a good long lasting source of energy for the brain. That's where, you know, all those healthy fats really teaching the brain to, um, to burn, uh, ketones for energy, actually burn, you know, uh, the, for the body to burn its own fat and for the brain to have access to ketone bodies for energy is, is a way more, uh, fuel efficient source compared to, your glucose that you're getting from you know sugar wow so with uh with your neuro health coaching are you able to help people who are like emotional eaters and stress eaters figure out how to you know figure that out like i know i'm an emotional eater but with my health program i have accountability i have a health coach i have a community uh -huh. and i know i can go to them and get their support if I'm like, ah, I'm so stressed out. Like I was doing taxes the other day and it, it just stresses me out. And I had the accountability to not do that. Um, she said she wanted a bag of M&Ms. Yes. Chocolate is my go-to, but I didn't do it. So, yeah. so is there something in your neuro health coaching that you can f figure out where that comes from and, and sort of f fix it in the brain? Or is that just a training thing that you have to have the willpower and the accountability. Um, is that possible? That's genetic. Cause I know your mom has the same problem. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Or is it, this not it, your wheelhouse? Question. <laughs> as far as, wait, that, let me just uh, clarify as far as what, what were you asking as far as the genetic component? As far as being able, cause like when you're, you're mapping the brain and everything to figure out, you know, what causes the emotion, maybe this is just the dumbest question ever, but whatever, you know, whatever causes in your brain for you to be an emotional eater or a stress eater or both, um, are you able to, would you be able to fix, fix that, that? With, with your, your programming? Yeah. 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 So, so I would say, I would say that's, that's another great example of, of something that, you know, is going to have, 
you know, is going to respond very well to both biological along with psychological interventions. Okay. So, you know, by, by helping the nervous system regulate its stress through the use of these different kind of neuromodulation technologies that, that uh, some of which we've, we've covered so far, you know, there's going to be less of a, hopefully less of a, you know, such a strong desire or impulse to stress eat. Um, you know, there hopefully is just not going to be as much stress that needs to be dealt with. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, obviously we, we, we can't avoid stress entirely. And, and when those situations do arise, it's, yeah, it's a matter of, you know, do you, do you cave in and eat the entire box of Oreos or, you know, with, with the coaching that I do, you know, it's, it's about, you know, first, you know, kind of identifying, you know, what are, what are some of those things that are leading people to stress eat, looking at some of the um, kind of, you know, underlying causes, underlying factors that are going on, um, but then helping people identify, you know, those situations in which they would prefer to, you know, respond differently and uh, prefer to, you know, deal with that stress in a different way besides just eating junk food because, uh, you know, they're able to kind of take, take the, the, uh, the, the, long you know the whole picture into account and look at you know the future of their long-term health and say you know yes this this eating these couple cookies is going to make me feel better tonight just as drinking this these few glasses of wine or you know what whatever else whatever else the vice might be but you know when it comes to their long-term health you know figuring out figuring out other ways is so important um just you know what, what we know is It'll become easier and easier as we kind of help people develop better habits and actually take actions um, that, that match those habits. It'll become easier and easier to resort to healthier foods and healthier behaviors when stress does come into play. All right, Toby, we got four minutes left, man. I'm going to try to do um, a couple plugs for you real quick and see if you have anything else you want to say, but... Man, this hour flew by. Uh, Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro.com. Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro.com. Uh, scheduling a free 15 um, minute neuro health consultation. They can do that with you. Uh, Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro yes. Podcast. Check that out. Social media Twitter at Wetsuit Podcast. Instagram Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro. And uh, make sure you sign up for the newsletter and get a free PDF called The Six Steps to Better Cognitive Performance. Toby, this thing flew by, man. Is there anything else you want to plug real quick? Yes, it sure did fly by. Um, Yeah, the other thing I would would mention for people, um, I'm not sure where where the majority of your listeners are based, but um, for people who are based in the South Florida or or actually um, also kind of the, the Tampa, St. Petersburg area, along with um, the Miami and Fort Lauderdale area. Um, my company is now working with, with clients in both of those areas. So if you're if you're in either of those locations and you have a desire to, to really um, take control of, of your, your brain health and reach, you know, re- really reach uh, peak cognitive performance, um, I would love to, to work with you. So feel free. Um, reach out to me on on any of those uh, uh, ways that you just mentioned, Wes. Um, all those are great ways to get in touch with me. And uh, yeah, so for, I would say for those those individuals who who are in those Florida locations, um, there's some really really cool services I offer. Um, some of which we've talked about today. Other other ones such as the the photobiomodulation helmet, where I've got this this bike helmet looking thing that's got about 250 LEDs inside of it that shines light, red and near-infrared light to the brain, stimulating the mitochondria, stimulating increased blood flow and oxygenation. Got a few other cool, uh, cool tricks up my sleeve, different, uh, different technologies that, uh, that I would love to, to get more and more people access to. So, and all that's on your website at Roscoe's Wet. Sorry, all that's on your website yes. at Roscoe's Wetsuit yes. Neuro.com. You can see pictures of all of that. We're just running out of time, man. Yes. Just stay on the line real quick. I have a Absolutely. couple plugs. All of those plugs that I've done are going to be on um, Wes Isley's Magic Life Podcast Facebook group. So if they go there, they'll see the podcast and then just click on the links below and it'll take you to all those things. I promise. 
stay on the line real quick, man. Awesome. Um, I'm going to do two plugs real fast. Our television show, Wes Isley's Magic Life, is in syndication across the country. Check it out. If you can't find it on your local television um, and you can't find it on Roku, uh, we're now rolling out episodes on our Patreon, so check that out. And check out our events page on wesisley.com for our upcoming public shows. We have a couple theater dates on there. And uh, check out wesisley.com for all of our merch. See you next week. week. Check us out online at wesisley.com and patreon.com forward slash Wes underscore Isley for behind the scene videos, blooper videos, never before seen footage, discounts on merchandise, magic trick tutorials, and more. That's Wes Isley spelled W-E-S-I-S-E-L-I. -S -E